Good afternoon. I expected a much larger crowd. I guess I can leave my flak jacket at home. Nice. So the title of this seminar, I guess it's posted as MQA, why are we fighting over it, and a couple of other things. But really, I kind of figured it's, it's more of an expose into the industry as a whole. And hopefully, when we leave here today, we're all going to be uh, singing Kumbaya together, uh, burning some marshmallows over campfire, and you know, be best friends, right? So I'm your lovely host. And uh, please pay attention to, why is this not working? All right. Please pay attention to the incredible animation. I mean, you want to see that again? I mean, that, that was cool. I, you have to admit. Danny Kay, right? All right, cool. So a little background on myself. I got infected with the Hi-Fi virus when I was 11, which is kind of a long time ago, right? And, and the way it happened, it was kind of funny. So I have an older brother who's 10 years my age. And he took me to a hi-fi show. So I grew up in Austria, in Vienna, and he took me to a hi-fi show. And I was like, dude, this is like Disneyland. Bouncing meters, right? Reel to reel, records being played, cassettes being dubbed. And I was like, this is awesome, right? And I, you know, what I wanted for Christmas, screw Disneyland, screw you know, all the, the, the cool space figures and stuff like that, Star Wars. Aliens, this, that, and the other. I wanted a hi-fi. So I got a boom box, right, from I think it was a sharp something or another. And I mean, I was tied to that thing. My mother would always tell me, dude, do your homework, stop playing music, do your homework, stop playing music. So I grew up with music, right? I mean, I really genuinely love music. And I think my biggest connecting dot for this hobby is the music, right? Do I love gear? Yeah, I love gear, right? I mean, otherwise I wouldn't be here, right? The gear affords me to listen to music at a much higher quality than otherwise, right? Which is great. It should be for everyone. But I think music fundamentally is the one thing that I, I love the most. And so I, I've got about 5,000 records, right? Uh, I have probably about eight terabytes of digital data. Chris Conacher over here was very kind and gracious to help me set up my NAS. And so, you know, what bugs the heck out of me is this hobby. Right, which is kind of ironic because if I look back, when I got infected with the virus, the hi-fi virus, it's not contagious. Um, all I wanted to do was share with others how cool listening to music is, right? And I, I moved to the States um, a couple of times back and forth, and then it was about 2000, I answered an ad in Stereophile. And it was the local Long Beach Audio Society and a fellow by the name of Dave Clark having a little snippet in there. Hey, we've got a Long Beach Audio Society meeting. Why don't you come and show up, right? Call this number, 562-555-5555, right? I'd like you all to pick up your phones and call Dave right now and just kidding. So I show up at this event. I open the door. And my first reaction was, geez, is this a model train convention? What's going on here, right? I mean, it was mostly older people, right? O older gentlemen, let's call it that, right? I was the young gun. Is there anyone here? I got a couple of people were here at the young gun seminar on, on Friday, right? So I was the young gun. And, you know, Dave and I hit it up. And he was like, hey, do you know how to write? And I'm like, uh, yeah, I guess so. I'm sh pretty sure I can figure it out. Well, you know, we're transitioning positive feedback from print magazine to online. And we're looking for new talent. And, uh, you know, you seem like you're the perfect sort of category for us to start writing about new content from a different perspective. So I was like, sure, let's do it. And here we are, you know, it's 2017, 16 years later. Uh, I'm one of the originators from, from Positive Feedback Online. And uh, I've, I've since ventured into a couple of other avenues. Um, I, I partnered up with a friend of mine who's no longer uh, affiliated with the publication called Sonic Flare, which mostly because of my day-to-day -day job, uh, which is not in hi-fi, by the way. Um, has been relegated to playing third or fifth fiddle, depending on the day of the week. Uh, and that blog is called Sonic Flare, which is great. Uh, follow me on Instagram if you like. Uh, it's probably where you'll, see, where you'll see most of the activity. And I wrote for a couple of magazines in Europe. I was also an uh, editor for the US um, copy of The Inner Ear. Does anyone remember Ernie Fisher? 
Yep, the inner ear, good old Ernie. He was from Austria too, right? So that was a connection. And so, you know, again, I, I come to this from the perspective of how do we broaden this range, right? Because, I mean, that's fundamentally what everybody always talks about, which always drives me nuts, by the way, is that, you know, how do we get young people into this industry? And the truth of the matter is, it's the wrong question to ask, because there's already young people in the industry. The question should be, how do we get young people interested in this? And I'm not really sure that that's what we want to do, right? And I'll get into that in a bit. So uh, before we get into that, let's take a look at a quote uh, from one of our great presidents. Uh, and this was, of course, President Merkin Muffley. Does anyone remember President Merkin Muffley? Yep. And of course, the, the great quote is, gentlemen, you can't fight in here. This is the war room, right? And so let's take a look at uh, what that actually looked like in the real world. Try B8654 Moscow. Yes, sir. You would never have found him through his office, Mr. President. Our Premier is a man of the people, but he is also a man, if you follow my meaning. <laughs> what did you say? I said Premier Kissov is a degenerate atheist. Mr. Mr. President, I formally right. request that you have his ignorant proof. I'm sorry, Mr. President. Mr. President. I think they're trying the number. Isn't that genius? So that was, of course, the film Dr. Strangelove. And, of course, President Merkin Muffley is uh, none other than Peter Sellers. Uh, but honestly, that's what it feels like. I mean, seriously, right? And I guess if you look at the title specifically, MQA, I mean, you read through some of the stuff. And I'm like, my head boils, right? And so it's like, you know, it, it's the forums, right? I mean, I love forums. They're great, right, for certain things. They're not so great for other things. Um, you know, I, I, I do not hang out on forums. Every now and then, I'll, I'll take a peek inside. Who, who here is on forums active? Nobody. Really? OK, good. All right, it's always the other guy who's active, right? Not yourself, right? Um, and so I, I look at some of the stuff and, and the vitriol that's going on on these forums, and it's like, guys, who's, uh, seriously, wow, take a chill pill, relax, right? There's more important things in life. And so, you know, let's kind of dive right into it, the whole MQA thing, right? So, look, here's my perspective on this, right? Master quality authenticated. Bob Stewart from Meridian had an idea to create a sort of next-gen file system that would allow high-res streaming to become mainstream, right? And by that I mean being able to pack up very dense files, scrub them in size so they can be streamed to just about anywhere. Wireless device, wireless phone, your tablet, your home computer, your home DAC, wherever you may be, right? And then unfold it essentially back into that high-res file. That's the premise, right? Is it without issues? No, it's not without issues. Is 4K without issues? Who has a 4K TV right now? You think that's without issues? Really? Right? So it's not without issues. But I think you got to look at the bigger picture, right? And I think when you look at the bigger picture, PCM, high-res PCM, DSD, I personally don't think that's going to go anywhere. I don't think DSD, I think DSD is going to stay sort of in our little niche, tiny little niche. They're going to be coming out with, you know, I always joke with Octo, Quad, Nano, DSD, whatever the next jump is, right? And great, good for them, right? PCM, you know, let's go beyond 24-bit, let's go beyond 192, great, good for you, right? Let's not make this a format, let's not make this about the format itself, let's make it about the music. How do we deliver higher quality music to more and more people? That's what this is all about, right? And I think when you look at the overall big picture, guess what? Public at large? They don't have a clue about high-res audio. I travel a lot, on the plane a lot. Every now and then when I feel like it, not often, but every now and then when I feel like it, I'll strike up a conversation with someone. And it always comes down to, hey, what are you listening to? Do you know about high-res audio? 
well, who, what, right? Nobody knows about high-res audio, right? What I think MQA gives us the ability to do is they've signed major contracts with all three remaining major labels. And they're using that leverage to push MQA into the wider world and wider audience. And they're piggybacking off of hi-fi which means that those people that hopefully at some point will be exposed to MQA files are going to pick up on, hey, there's this thing called hi-fi. Right? By the way, ask your neighbor what hi-fi means. Right? We'll get into that in just a minute. And so I think, you know, uh, what was it, the press release that just came out, I guess LG announced their new phone, the V30, uh, of which they're going to sell only six devices, I think to the owner of the company and his family. Just kidding. Um, uh, you know, will people buy that device because of MQA? I sincerely doubt it, right? Um, will people buy any device because of MQA? I, you know, who knows, right? I doubt it. But I think it's going to be a bonus. I think it's going to be one of those things where you're going to be able to say, hey, look, you can natively unfold MQA on your phone, right? Tidal Hi-Fi. Who subscribes to the title? Hi-Fi, right? All of you? Most of you. Do you think the general public knows about Tidal? They don't. Clueless. The only thing that people know about in the real world is Spotify, mostly, YouTube, and Apple Music. And Apple Music is kind of, you know, inching up to Spotify levels of knowledge and understanding and you know just overall market presence, right? And so Tidal comes up, uh, never heard of it. Tidal Hi-Fi comes up, dude, you just, you know, you, 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 you reduce the small size of a pie to, an, to a crumb. Because nobody knows about Tidal Hi-Fi, right? And it's 20 bucks a month, which I think is great. I mean, I think Tidal Hi-Fi is fantastic. And now, of course, they've piggybacked with MQA and so some of these files are available. Actually, an ever-growing collection of files is available in MQA. Personally, me, I have not had the pleasure of actually hearing a, a, a true apples-to-apples -apples comparison of an MQA file and a non-MQA file. Okay, I know that others have been. I have not. What I have heard and what I have compared myself is MQA files versus other files that I have on my NAS, right? Some of them are better, some of them are about the same, and some of them I, you know, don't really hear a difference one way or the other, okay? But you know what? That's fine. It's okay. I'm not worried about it. Because I think what's going to happen with, hopefully, the continued presence of MQA making their marketing push with the big major labels, and hopefully those major labels getting off their butts and starting to actually advertise that they have high-res content, which by the way, when's the last time you saw a Sony commercial advertising high-res content? Exactly. When's the last time you saw Universal Music advertise high-res content? Never. When's the last time, and so on and so forth, and so on and so forth, right? So is MQA a good vehicle for that? All other things being equal? I think so. What's the alternative, right? And to those people, who are absolutely steadfast against MQA. Dude, no one's forcing you to buy it, right? No one's forcing you to buy it. Do you want to make a judgment call on it? Go ahead, knock yourself out. I don't really care one way or the other, right? If it makes the files that I listen to sound better, great for me. And the files that I've heard it make, that makes it sound better, I love it. Is it because of MQA specifically, or is it because of a different mastering, or a different you know, uh, day of the week that the tape machine was running when they were remastering that tape for the 55th time? I don't know. Could be. But it's making it sound better. And that's all I care about, right? And so I think really honestly, the, the, the big sort of picture here, for me anyway, is that if we want to grow this industry, we got to stop the bickering. We got to stop this insane fighting that's going on. Because otherwise, we're just doomed forever. And MQA is going to go over our heads 
and LG is going to sell seven phones instead of six. And you know the people are going to get behind MQA. They're going to get behind MQA. Techniques, Onkyo, you know whoever else is going to sign up from the big sort of big box consumer retail um, channels and also retail or uh, consumer goods manufacturers. And so again, do we want to get on that train or do we not want to get on that train? Right? That's cool. Good for you. So, hi-fi. Let's pivot the conversation over to hi-fi. Hi-fi is largely experience driven. Does anyone agree with that? I think all of us agree with that, right? It's largely experience driven. There used to be, I think there still is, a German DIN standard for hi-fi high fidelity. I think it was made up in probably the early 70s. I could be wrong, but I think it was the early 70s. And it's got some vague measurements of, you know, flat frequency response and some signal to noise ratio. And that was kind of about it, right? And I forgot the name of the standard, but it's a DIN standard. It actually exists. And so who cares, right? Because I mean, truly, honestly, you're not walking around any of these rooms here today asking, hey, are you DIN so-and-so certified? you're not goodbye, right? I mean, you're walking in there because either you appreciate the gear, it looks cool, it's got tubes, it's got solid state, it's got big speakers, it's got little speakers, the guy that's selling it is an idiot, the guy that's selling it is great, the guy that's marketing it is a genius, right? And so you connect with people and therefore it's an experience, right? And that's, at the end of the day, that's all it is. It's an experience, right? The better you make that experience, guess what? The more you're gonna sell the more you're gonna connect with people, right? And so, I mean, you know, one thing that I'd like to always posit in these types of conversations is, you know, why hi-fi, right? Um, if, if I go into a Best Buy and I ask the sales clerk, why should I get a 4K TV? He'll be able to rattle off 10 sentences he's learned at a training, why I need to get a 4K TV. If I go into a watch store, a timepiece store, let's use the more connoisseur type lingo, right? And I ask a guy, hey, why should I get a Rolex? Why should I get an AP? Why should I get XYZ, a Patek or whatever? He's gonna be able to tell me why. It's a timepiece, right? Mechanical engineering perfection, right? A tiny little watch with upwards of 300 parts in it, 500 parts sometimes even more. The grander the complications, the more parts it is, right? So there's, there's an intrinsic value to it, right? If I go into an Aston Martin dealership, I know why I'm there. I'm not asking, hey, you know, gee, what am I doing here, right? You come to a hi-fi show for, as an outsider, what the hell am I doing here? What's going on here? They're listening to music. I mean, what, what's that all about, right? So we need to figure out the why, right? Because I think what's happening is that you know, as we're sort of struggling with this whole industry, which is, of course, what we always hear about, right? Which is kind of funny, because, you know, I, I go to auto shows. I, I actually slid into auto shows. So this is a true story, a little segue. So I slid into uh, to, to car reviewing through Bang & Olufsen. Uh, it was 2006, and Audi had just signed a deal with Bang & Olufsen uh, to feature their system in the then-new Audi A8, right? And it was a $15,000 option to get on your car. And so they had a press junket, and I reached out to them. I was like, hey, you know, I've always been in the car hi-fi. You know, could I perhaps listen to this? Oh, we'll do much better than that. You know, we'll fly you out to Chicago. That's where Bang & Olufsen was headquartered. I think they're still there. And um, I forgot the gal's name. She was a wonderful PR person. Um, not as wonderful as Sue, but, you know, a wonderful PR person. And uh, you're welcome. And uh, she was like, hey, you know what? We'll, we'll fly you out. Uh, we'll, we'll let you experience this system. Again, experience, right? Notice the, the, the theme. And um, long story short, I develop a great relationship with them. And they're like, you know, by the way, there's other cars that are going to come out with Bang & Olufsen systems. Um, Aston Martin, et cetera, et cetera. Would you be interested in reviewing those cars too? Nah, come on, no, no way. You can't force me to an Aston Martin. You know, I'd kill myself, right? So obviously, you know, I said yes, yes, yes. 
And so true story, I, I, I'm back in LA, and this is about 2007, and Audi announced the R8, right? Their first sort of real sports car, right? Does anyone know what I'm talking about, the Audi R8? Yeah, great car, amazing car, right? And um, I get invited to this press junket. Again, it's at the Beverly Hills Hotel. And I'm sitting at a table, it was breakfast. I'm sitting at a table, there's 10 of us. And I'm you know, part of Sonic Flare, I'm there. Uh, the guy next to me was, you know, I forgot the guy's name from Road and Track, famous editor, right? Motor Trend over here, Automobile Magazine. And then, does anyone watch Chris Harris? When I say the name Chris Harris, does that ring a bell? Auto Reviews. He's now with Top Gear, I believe. Uh, but he does his own shows, or he used to do his own shows. Really cool guy. Um, and so the round table was like, you know, everybody was introducing themselves. And, you know, so-and-so would say, hey, I'm with Automobile Magazine. Oh, wow, you know, great, awesome, good job, blah, blah, blah. And, you know, it became my turn. And, you know, I'm the great Danny Kay and silence, right? And then the next one was like, you know, I'm with uh, Sonic Flare and uh, more silence, right? And they're like, okay, so, you know, what are you doing here? Who are, well, you know, I write for a couple of hi-fi magazines. I'm trying to get it, you know, the, 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 broad, the broader audience reach, right? And, oh, okay, cool. Yeah, you know, I actually, I have a hi-fi at home too, and, you know, it's really nice, and it's, I'm glad to see that people are coming into this. Anyway, so that was my, my introduction to, to, uh, to, to the automobile world. And it's kind of spawned off on, on its own legs from there, right? So I got introduced to uh, the folks at Ferrari, at Lamborghini, all the top class car manufacturers, right? Rolls Royce, et cetera, et cetera. And the point that I was trying to make is that, you know, they never sit around, I can guarantee you that, they never sit around on a table trying to figure out, hey, you know, gee, how do we get more young people into this, right? How do we get more young people to buy a Ferrari or to aspire to buy a Ferrari? I mean, really? You know, I, you know, last I checked, everybody that's a young kid is like, Ferrari, dude, yeah, I'd love one, right? I mean, who wouldn't want one, right? And so I think, again, that the premise of the question that we always ask is completely lopsided. It's not how do we get young guys into this. It's how do we get young people and older people more interested in the hi-fi and not get them into it, but get hi-fi to them, right? And I'll talk about that in a second. And so I think what, what's happening at these shows in my humble opinion, which is not so humble, of course, is that I feel like we're all selling a piece of the puzzle, right? I instead of selling the big picture, which is the experience of listening to music playback at a fundamentally different level than your you know, smartphone, than your tablet, than your little Bose speaker that you buy for $199 at Costco, at Target, wherever you go, Target, right? Um, and so instead of selling this big picture, right, this wonderful piece of art that is music, we're selling pieces of a puzzle. We're selling, you know, the tubes. We're selling the solid state. We're selling MQA. We're selling DSD. We're selling high-res PCM. We're selling turntables. We're selling cartridges. We're selling power conditioners. We're selling speaker cables. We're selling RCA cables. We're selling tchotchkes for this, tchotchkes for that, right? And so it, I think it's taking away from what we should be selling, which is the experience of listening to music in a beautiful, engaged way, right? Wouldn't you all agree that that should be our goal, right? Everybody's head should be nodding, yes. And so again, I think we're, we're kind of like setting ourselves up for failure by, by looking at this from the perspective of how do I sell a better mousetrap? Because guess what? The guy next to you, he's going to figure out a better mousetrap. And it's not about the mousetrap. It's about the mouse. How do you catch the mouse? Right? And so that's what it's all about. And so when we pivot again from hi-fi into the world of 4K TVs, right, and 4K media, there's a couple of interesting things that are going on there, right? So first of all, 4K TVs are at a new baseline. If you do not believe that, the doors are right there in the back. Feel free to exit. I mean, it's, it's, it's unquestionable. 4K is the new TV standard. You know what's going to be the new TV standard in five years? Probably eight. 8K is going to be the new standard. Do you see people fighting over those standards? I don't. If you do, point them out to me. Yes, they have their forums too. Yes, they have their naysayers. But it's nothing like what I see on our side sometimes. And so I think, again, 
the, the, the TV, the consumer industry at large, has this incredible cap capability of rallying around a standard. And by rallying, I really mean like, dude, we're going to get behind this because our livelihood depends on it. When's the last time you saw that happen on DSD? Didn't happen. When's the last time you saw that happen on a high-res PCM? Didn't happen. I mean, fundamentally, if you took a guy from 1950 to a hi-fi show, he would largely have the same experience as he did in 1950. Meanwhile, 67 years have passed, or 77 years have passed. I suck at math. Take a guy from 1950, show him a TV screen, and then put him in front of a 75-inch, you know, 4K TV today, it, you know, let's face it, there's probably going to be poo-poo somewhere, right? Because it's going to be like, holy cow, what just happened? This is crazy stuff. Do you see what I'm saying? They're able to get behind industry standards and really push the whole industry forward. Yes, there's bickering. Yes, there's fighting. But they put that aside for the greater goal of the whole industry. And so no one really argues, hey, 4K TVs, gee, let me think. Eh, you know what? No, no, no. They haven't figured out the exact formula. This is no good. We're not going to do it. So they're doing it, and they're getting behind it. And of course, as they get behind it, prices are dropping. Capitalism starts working, right? Or it works anyway, but you know, it, it shows its effect. And so now you can walk into a Costco and get a 4K TV at 60 inches for, I don't know, 800 bucks last I checked. It's incredible. It's an industry where people support the standards. Another thing that's interesting, which I think opens up a, a new piece of conversation. Anyone seen the movie Dunkirk this summer? Great movie, right? Christopher Nolan, the director, was so adamant about how that movie needed to be presented that he wouldn't allow theaters to show it if they didn't have a certain baseline minimum of what that movie was supposed to look like. Quentin Tarantino, Hateful Eight. Has anyone seen that movie? There you go. Here's another guy. Very adamant, very fanatic, in a good way, about what he wants the, the, the audience to experience when they watch their movie, right? And that's a good thing. I mean, Spielberg, same thing, right? And Stanley Kubrick, I mean, of all people, right? When a movie 2001 came out, lots of stuff going on around, hey, you really have to support the way that I want you to see this movie, or otherwise you're not going to show it. You can look all that up. It's all you know, digitized online. When was the last time that someone in hi-fi, a producer, a musician, a director, a symphonic conductor, anyone, came up and said, this is how I want you to experience music playback? Does anyone know? Can't think of one. Sure they do. Sure they do. Sure they do. They do. Yes, no, yes, no, yes, no. I think they do, right? If you don't think they do, that's fine, right? And money makers, it's, it's the company's biggest money makers would say, no, we're not going to do this until you meet our standards. The company doesn't meet their standards. Well, but I mean, again, it, it, it's, it, it comes down to if one guy asks for it and doesn't get it, I get that. But if all of them would stand up, all of them would stand up and say, hey, look, dude, this is how this is going to go down. It would happen. I really believe that it would happen, right? And so I think that's another sort of interesting thing, like because you know, I, I, I mean, even musicians, you, you, we don't have to, have to think even that large of you know defining an actual standard for hi-fi playback. I, I know a couple of musician friends in LA, right? I live in LA. They don't care what you play their stuff on. I, I mean, they love hearing it when they come over to my place. They're like, oh, this is, sounds great, better than even in the studio, right? fill in your blank story there, right? But their own system, a pair of Bose speakers. Their own system, a pair of earbuds that come with their phone. 
I'm like, dude, what's wrong with you? Don't you care about what your music actually sounds like? I mean, isn't that what you're recording? Yeah, but I really want people to listen to the music. Right? So even our musicians don't care really about what you played back on. But I can tell you one thing, I mean, because I, I, I have friends in the, um, the movie industry. Again, there's that LA thing. Um, in LA, you're either a waiter or in the movie industry. And I'm neither. I'm homeless. Just kidding. Um, and so all, all my director friends and, and friends that I have in the industry, believe me, they care very much about what, how you view their produced content. Right? They spend an inordinate amount of time color correcting film. They spend an inordinate amount of time editing it to look exactly visually the way they want that film to look. And yet, our guys, well, you know, I'm happy if you listen to my song on earbuds. And that's fine, but at least set some kind of a goal of, hey, you know what, I think it would actually be really cool if you heard what I heard when I wrote that song, and I'd love for you to experience it that way. Which kind of segues into another thing. Do we have any brand ambassadors in the industry? We don't. Right? Tennis players, they're all watch ambassadors. I don't know why, I guess the whole timekeeping thing probably. But they're all, you know, running around with fancy watches. Movie industry, same thing. Tom Cruise, does anyone know Tom Cruise? Heard of the name? Probably, right? Yes, maybe. So Tom Cruise, from what I understand, I could be wrong, but I, I'm pretty sure the guy has three dedicated hi-fi systems in his homes. I think one of them, maybe even two, are from Oswald Mills Audio. Have you ever heard him talk about hi-fi? Crickets. Right? It's kind of sad. I mean, it's really sad. It's painful, actually. Right? So if we take a look at our exposure in general, the content that we write, the content that I review, I admit it, I write it for our industry, for people that are already affected by the buck, for people that are already into this, that get what this is all about. However, there's really no meaningful cross-functional pollination of exposing other folks, other writers, from the tech world, for example, right, to our industry. In fact, every time I would argue that, that someone at Engadget, Gizmodo, TechCrunch, Recode, whatever that magazine outlet may be, writes about hi-fi, it's generally with some kind of a sly undertone. Oh, these cuckoos over there with their wires, right? I, I, I listened to uh, Leo Laporte. Any Leo Laporte fans here? Yeah, same, same way, right? Every now and then I'll, you know, if I drive up to Big Bear, um, I'll listen to him for two hours, yak on about whatever. And he's a cool guy, right? And every now and then, someone will call in and ask a question about hi-fi, right? Hey, I saw that DVLA speaker for $3,000. What do you think of that, Leo? Oh, you're crazy, man, $3,000? Dude, that's insane. Who would spend that kind of money on a speaker? So Scott Walker or Scott Wilkinson from, uh, you know, uh, what's that? Um, thank you. Home theater. Um, hey, so uh, that new LG G7 uh, for $6,000, what do you think of that? Oh, it's great. It's amazing. It's awesome. You've got to go out and buy it. Dude, seriously? You just poo-pooed hi-fi, that's three grand, but at the same time, the very next sentence, you're extolling the virtues of a $6,000 60-inch TV, right? I mean, come on. We can do better than that. So I think there, there, there's, there's lots of room there to bring some of these folks into our world and give them a meaningful exposure and sort of education on what it is that we do and why it is that we do what we do. We'll leave Q&A for, for, for after. Thank you. Um, social media madness, YouTube, one of my favorites. So, if you look at YouTube, uh, it, you know, I, I, I guess, I, first of all, I'm a cord cutter. Does anyone even know what that means? I guess some people I know in the audience do, right? So I cut my cord about two years ago. I'm done with TV. 
Uh, I have DirecTV now, which I rarely watch, and I signed up for that 35 bucks a month plan back in like six, seven months ago when they announced it on my Apple TV. Um, I watch YouTube, right? And I watch movies, obviously. TV, regular TV, rarely even watch it, right? It's just nonsense. Having said that, when I'm on YouTube, there's a couple of cool guys that I follow, right? Um, MKBHD, Chris, do you know him? Marcus Brownlee? Yeah. Super cool guy, right? He's a tech reviewer, right? Any one of his videos, any one of them, gets over a million views on YouTube. Now, you know, and I get it. He's the exception, right? I mean, for every one Marcus Brownlee, there's literally probably a million guys that will never get noticed. But nonetheless, the guy reviews a phone. Uh, Sue, you should probably contact him for that MQA thing, right? Because you'll get a million views, right? Uh, the guy reviews a phone. The guy reviews a, a speaker system, a little uh, desktop system. The guy reviews a, a gimbal for a camera. Dude, the guy gets a million views. So let's pivot over to the world of hi-fi, right? And it's a sad state, let me tell you that. It's a sad state. I mean, we can barely crack 20,000 viewers on any given video that's strictly related to hi-fi, right? Now, look, the production quality, I mean, MKBHD's videos, that's what he goes under on his YouTube channel, are first rate. And the guy knows what he's doing, right? He's exceptional video editing skills, exceptional cinematography skills. When they do a video, they do it the right way. Why can't we do videos the right way? Why can't we have videos on the same level as a guy reviewing a $600 cell phone, right? We don't have the time. I, I actually thought of pulling up a couple of them to show you guys. I mean, it's atrocious. Some of the stuff that I see from us, it's just, oh my gosh, turn it off. I don't even want to watch it. It's ridiculous. So I think there's social media that we have access to that we're completely not leveraging, completely not utilizing. We're not even paying attention to it, right? And in fact, on, on the, the Young Guns conversation that we had on, on Friday, a gentleman uh, in the audience was like, yeah, but you know, YouTube is so difficult to break that 100,000 viewership. And you know, yet people do it every day. They figured out a way to get into that club, right? I, I watch a lot of, um, again, the, the, the car side with cool cars and stuff. There's a couple of guys that I follow. Same thing, million plus views, half a million views. Two million views. It's amazing, right? Do they talk about anything specific? No. It's a car review built around the experience. I'm willing to bet if we put our heads together collectively, figure out, hey, dude, we're going to hire some professional video editors that actually know what they're doing. We could create some incredible videos about the experience of hi-fi, put it on YouTube, and it will get picked up. But it has to be cool. Right? It has to be hip. It's got to be meaningful to someone of the young guns generation looking at this and saying, hey, dude, this is really neat. I want to be part of that. Affiliations. It's a zero sum game. That's how our industry operates. If I sell something, you're not going to sell something. If you sell something, he's not going to sell something. Right? We need to get beyond the, you know, marketing ourselves to the same six people Monday through Friday. Saturday, the stuff gets packed up. Sunday, it's on audio gone. And Monday, the rat race starts again. Right? I mean, you guys are all chuckling, but you know it's true. Right? Or someone picks up a new line, they call their 10 customers, dude, forget about what I sold you six months ago. You got to get this way, way better. Let's stop selling to the same six people. Let's start selling to the next 12 people. How about that? Let's start small, right? Again, don't sell a better mousetrap. Sell a better experience. There are dealers, believe you me, that get it. Very few of them. Very, very few of them. But there are dealers that get it. If you're ever in the LA area, I highly recommend you check out the audio salon in Santa Monica, Bergamont Station. A fellow by the name of Meyer Shadi runs it. Totally gets it. It's all about the experience. White glove service. 
So another thing, pet peeve of mine, right? You look at high-end audio, the prices that the gear commands, rightfully so in many cases, right? Fancy casework costs a lot of money. Electronics copied from 1950s over, probably not so much. But that's a different conversation, right? There's a reason why that costs 40 grand. Machining cost, tooling cost, million dollar Haas machines for you know, five axis CNC machining, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I explain it all the time. I host my own sort of infamous music parties in my house about every other month or so, and I bring in all my friends, right? And they all love hi-fi. And you know, I, I've probably converted about a half of them to, uh, to get into hi-fi, right? Bought them some used gear that's great, and they love it. They would never set foot into a hi-fi show like ours. No interest whatsoever. There's nothing in it for them. It's not cool. It's not hip. Right? It's guys bickering over cables and whatever. And so, again, it's like we, we need to figure out, we've we got to stop the fighting or, you know, lower it down to a lower level. And we've got to get together as an industry and figure out, hey, dude, there's so much amazing stuff happening in our hobby. We need to get more people to notice us. And I think it's going to have to come from the outside in. Right? I don't think any equipment manufacturer represented here today has the financial wherewithal to go out and follow and pursue these guys nonstop. You can't do it. It costs too much money. We have to get some of those guys to understand what it is that we're doing and piggyback off of them talking about our hobby to their audience of millions and millions of people and exposing them to what we do. I'll leave it with one quote from the great Steve Jobs. And I think it's so amazing, right? I mean, the guy was a, truly a genius, right? You can't connect dots looking forward. You can only connect them looking backwards. So you have to hope that the dots looking forward will connect. And I think it's awesome, right? And I think that's exactly where we're at. We need to start looking at the dots looking forward and not the ones in the back. Because the ones in the back, again, take the guy from 1950, put him in front of a hi-fi today, more or less the same experience. Put him in front of a 4K TV, get some diapers. Right? Q&A. Yes. Thank you. had one uh, brand ambassador and that was Neil Young with Pono. Um, what are your True. thoughts on what are your thoughts on that and why it failed? Assuming you think it failed. Yeah, yeah, no, actually, you know what? I'm glad you brought it up. Yes. Um, how could I forget the great Neil Young? You know, um, he was trying to sell a better mousetrap. I don't think he was trying to sell a better experience. I mean, yes, he said that, you know, hey, you're missing out on so much music and stuff, but you know, it's one thing to, to, to hold a, a device in your, in your hands and, and tell an audience, because I saw him do it on, on you know, late night TV shows and all that where he was on. And it's one thing to tell people, hey, you know, this thing is really cool. You have to check this out, right? Versus, okay, let's build an actual experience center or a place where you can actually go and experience that, right? I think he would have had more success teaming up with individual regionalized dealers, retailers, pop-up stores, where he would have said, hey, look, tomorrow you go to this address and you hear what I'm talking about. You'll hear it for yourself. Right? I think he would have had more success with that. And frankly, I think you know, when he came out with, with Pono, which is now, what, three years ago, four years ago about, right? Um, you know, I think lots has happened. In, in, the, in the technology, the consumer technology space over the last couple of years, where, um, again, if, if he would have taken a slightly different approach, in my opinion, he, he probably would have had more success. Great point, though. And it's not only, but see, it's, it, you know, and again, I keep going back to the same thing. It's, it, you know, you, Neil Young, great, right? We need 50 Neil Youngs. 
Right? I mean, every musician, in my opinion, should be going out and saying, dude, okay, cool, I get the fact that you only have money for X, Y, Z, or you, know, you want to listen to your music on your AirPods, and, and you like that. But what you really should do is listen to music on a hi-fi. Right? I mean, if, if, if you know, the, 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 the you know, Jimmy Dean director at, um, uh, uh, what's that school in LA? Um, you know, USC Film School can demand and, and advocate for you watching his movie, his student film, right? The way that he wants you to see it, then why can't the musician do the same thing? Because at the end of the day, it's all about the experience. So anyway, that's what we need. If you know musicians, you better tell them that. Tell them I said so. Yes? Well, on that point, actually, oh, sorry, this is maybe more of a statement than a question, but I'd be curious to hear your reaction to it. Having worked with a lot of musicians and said, oh, you know, you must have an awesome hi-fi, they're like, no, I'm not really that into hi-fi. So I found that most musicians, I don't know, they, they don't... It doesn't not, register with them. Yeah, and I, but I wonder why, right? Because we're, we're all here, you know, sort of worshipping at, at the temple of hi-fi from the stuff they're producing, but they don't actually care. Because <laughs> they haven't heard it themselves. There's no place to hear it. I mean, retailing, as we know, for hi-fi is dead. I mean, let's face it, right? I mean, like I said, there's a couple of guys that I think get it, or I know that get it. And they're doing an incredible job within the confines of what they're capable of doing. I mean, I wish I could replicate Meyer's Audio Salon 50 times over the country. Probably not going to happen, right? But I, I think that answers your point, right? They, they, they themselves haven't heard it, right? I mean, I've got a guy in Long Beach, you know, tries to be like sort of an experimental um, Kraftwerk-esque kind of a guy with electronic music. And every now and then he'll come over and bring some demos over to hear what it sounds like, right? Because all he's listening to is some stupid little whatever thingamajig, who's a dinky, for 500 bucks at Best Buy. And I'm like, dude, you know, I get it, but you got to experience it. And when he experiences it, he's like, oh, wow, this is awesome. Well, I, I'm like, so how cool would it be if, if everyone that listened to your stuff would get to hear it that way? Oh, yeah, I never thought about it that way, right? Because they themselves haven't heard it. Yes. Uh, the difference between 1644 and 2496 is very, very subtle. This is not a huge experience that the average consumer can can, can catch immediately. Why would MQA bring people to high-end audio? More likely, the, the CAF LS50W, which is, enables one to set up a hi-fi system by merely plugging your computer into it, makes a lot more sense and is the experience, even though it is a product. So, so my, my answer to that is technology moves on, right? Why would... You know, why would Sony make a 4K TV? That's not what I'm it, saying. Is 4K that much better than 1080p? You know, truth of the matter of the f is no. I mean, you, you, you have to take into account viewing distances, et cetera, et cetera. And, you know, I, let's face it, your eye quality, right? Can you visually measure and see the fact that 4K is four times the resolution? So it's kind of the same analogy. But 4K isn't bringing people to to TV, the change between regular uh, NC, uh, NTSC and the HD TV was the change that did it. It was a massive change. Sure. Now you're talking about a very little change about people who aren't interested in hearing CDs in the first place on a good hi-fi system. Right. Uh, well, so you, I mean, and this is supposed to be a, a, a thing about MQA. Well, again, I, you know, it, it's a great question. I think there, there's multiple answers to it, right? I mean, on one hand, like I said, you know, technology fundamentally moves forward. And, and we either get behind that or we don't get behind it. And, you know, you, you have to make the step forward. Is MQA the best thing that we could have come up with? Probably not. But show me an alternative, right? Show me an alternative. What's better? What, what would be a better mechanism than to leverage the last... The only three remaining record labels, Universal, BMG, and uh, um, 
Sony, thank you. Uh, then to get them to understand that, dude, you know, I get the fact that you guys keep wanting to make money at this. Well, here's a way to do it. What, what, what other alternative are you going to come up with? Are you going to start selling the public tapes, tape machines? I mean, come on. Records? You know, records are great. I've got 5,000 of them. I listen to records a lot. Probably 80% of my listening is records, right? But that's not the future. I mean, I hate to say it. It's, you know, it's, I, I think it's obvious, right? And, and look, the scarcity of good original records is, is increasing at an exponential rate. And so are the prices, by the way. Right? And so, you know, try to explain a guy who can't afford $500 for a decent pair of headphones why he needs to buy, you know, a $500 copy of Kind of Blue that's an original pressing. So you have to get behind the technology. I mean, all this stuff is a great periphery, but you have to get behind the technology. And again, what else are you going to do? Is there another MQA thing out there? I don't see it. Is it the best thing we could have come up with? Who knows, but it's what we came up with. Right? And if that's what it takes to get the record labels to understand that, hey, we need to do this, then that's what we need to do until someone comes up with a better mousetrap. I'm passionate about it. Can you tell? Danny? Danny? Yes. Steven? You can talk about this thing, about it being this train we have to get on. And there's just no evidence that anybody wants high-res audio, or there'd be some high-res audio out there. It can't get where it's going. I told Mark Fine at the LA Audio Show, yeah, good luck with that. High-res audio is a very tough sell. If you're trying to convince those of us that think MQA is the right way to go, and we should stop, you can just forget that notion. It's not going to happen. And if you don't like the industry press burning itself down, stop. Just stop promoting. We're going to think about different directions that I'm not really ready to talk about because it hasn't been fleshed out. Let us do it. But I mean, I, I think you're looking at it as a, from the singular perspective of MQA, no, right? I'm looking at it from the singular perspective of. I'm looking at it at a singular perspective of high res won't get you where you want to go. Okay, if you need to get to the people that we think are viable customers, high res will not help you get there. So forget. Okay. That's it. I'm going home. <laughs> I'm packing up. I'm done. Out of here. Good night. Good luck. You want to know the biggest reason I got title? It wasn't because it, part of it was for the hi-fi, but part of and part of it was the convenience of the library. But a big part of it, I got tired of curating my own music because I'm busy. I have all of these other things that I'm doing. I don't want to have to spend hours buying CDs and ripping them and tagging them and putting them on a hard drive and then getting them on my phone and that whole process takes time, which a lot of people my age don't want to spend, but they want good music. I understand completely what you're saying. We're not talking about somebody who's actually wandered into a hi-fi show. We're talking about trying to reach out to other people. And yes. what you're saying is being worked on other ways and let that process work itself out. I see MQA as part of that process, though, because look at Tidal. What is the Tidal what? needs lower <laughs> bandwidth, higher quality files so that they can get it across the wire? I don't want And to. wait, one of the other things that I've learned, I reach out to my friends and I, sh I show them what it sounds like through my gear. And, and they ask, how can I do that? And if I tell them, try B8654 3 Moscow. Yes, sir. You would never have found him through his office, Mr. President. Our Premier is a man of the. There is no fighting in the war room! This is the war room, damn it!
it's all good. Look, I just wanted to get back to sta thank you to standards for a little bit. Um, I sat on a couple of standards committees over the years. Standards are promulgated by huge corporations. They're not promulgated by artists or individuals or even inventors unless they're really lucky. Um, all the big standards, the 45 RPM record, the 33 RPM record, CD, and we can go on and on and on, is all from big companies saying sales are dropping. What are we going to do to bring sales back up? The SACD was only the, uh, there because Sony and Philips patents ran out. And they said, what are we going to do now? And of course, they screwed it up when they did it. But the point is, that's the only reason why it came out. They were not interested in high-res audio at all. Um, same thing with DVD, Blu-ray, Super Blu-ray, and all the rest of these things. Now, it just seems to me that, um, well, in talking about MQA, let me just, for a moment, I spoke to them several times over the years. Their goal is to have Apple put MQA into the iPhone with a 50 cent chip and the software and sell 250 million devices a year with MQA on it, which means that everyone else will have to have MQA on it. Yeah, they did the same thing with the yeah. DVD and Meridian lossless packaging. That's right. Back that, in the day. That's right? how they intend to do this. Um, sure. Apple is a licensee, but they don't seem to be interested in, in doing anything right now. But I think the problem with standards, it's not artist based. If every single artist got up today and said, we want 2496, the record companies would say, sit down. You know, I, the end of it. Yeah. I, I get your point, but to me, it sounds like the board of directors at Ferrari sitting in a room, right, uh, smoking their favorite cigarettes, eating lots of pasta, and arguing whether Shell should increase the octane rating of the fuel that's available. And why Shell has decided that 98 octane gas is all they're going to do. Right? They're like, no. It is what it is, right? We're just going to create an incredible car with an incredible experience packed behind it with the gas that you can get. I don't understand what that has to do with it. Well, because you're trying, I mean, again, it seems to be going back to the whole why MQA, MQA this, MQA that. It is what it is. I mean, no one's forcing you to buy it. Why? No, that's not the point. The point is that MQA, which broke off from Iridium because being part of Meridian, they said it would fail right away, so they had to be independent. But the problem is they are trying to force this as a standard, and some companies are interested, but they... Somebody's always forcing a standard. Well, somebody's always trying. No, the, someone's always forcing a standard. Are you kidding me? Do we have 110-volt electricity in each of our rooms? Oh, well, that was a governmental... Oh, oh, that was something different. Gotcha. Okay. do with private industry. Right. We're talking about two different things. Don't conjoin them. Right. They're not the same. Someone always has a standard. It always does, right? I mean, it's either mandated by government, right? Government creates it, or someone at government creates it, or some private entity comes up with something that they want to sell, right? God bless them for doing it, and they create a standard around it. I mean, Blu-ray is a standard that was created, right? Anything's a standard. I mean, the, the fact that, you know, this chair has four legs, that's a standard, right? more or less, right? So I mean, I, again, we can talk about all we want about standards and about MQA and is it the right thing, is it the wrong thing, is there something better out there? I'm sure there is something better out there, right? But I, I don't know. I think it's just missing the point. That's cool. Let's go grab a beer. Yes? So why is it that, why is it that people want a Blu-ray and they want 4K but they don't want it. Is it is it just because? Is it just because this our industry can't say it? Our industry, right? Is it just because our industry, the industry of stereo, the music industry can't say it well, and the movie industry can say it well? Yeah, that's, that's not probably the, a reason to it. I mean, it's part of it, but but that can't be the that can't be the only reason. Well, I mean, fundamentally, what's interesting to me is the fact that all this the music that's being recorded today is all being recorded in high res anyway. Yeah, that's, okay. and Apple, from what I understand, Apple, I think you told me, you told me before, Apple has all these high res files and they never yeah, use them. Yeah, sure. So, so, so does Universal, so, so does, you know, everyone else. Um, yeah, great question, right? Uh, you know, I don't know the answer to that. I, I think they're just lousy at marketing. 
I think there's, there's people that are great at marketing something, and then there's people that are just lousy at marketing something. And I think our industry happens to just be lousy at marketing the value add of high-res music, or music, period. Anyway, uh, guys, you were great, particularly you in the front row. Thanks for being quiet. Um, uh, uh, thank you all for coming. Cool yes, to see it. real quick. S real quick. Let the market decide. That's all. Awesome. Good stuff. Thanks, guys.